Over the mighty fortresses and blood-soaked battlefields of the Second War stands Black Rock Mountain, a place that from its molten heart to its most isolated caverns overflows with danger and thus the call to adventure. My name is Shubsy and today in Warcraft's Space and Story we'll begin our journey in the Black Rock Depths, into the heart of the Dark Iron Dwarf Empire where we'll see game design and lore work in tandem to realise the society and culture of a people at a scale found rarely in game. We'll get to see their great works and their great cruelties side by side. And as a living, growing place, we'll be able to track the impact of events both historical and recent. Now as many of you know, Black Rock Depths is a truly massive dungeon. Dwarfing, if you'll pardon the joke, any other many times over. So today we'll be setting the stage for the many different parts of Black Rock Mountain further down the line and pushing roughly halfway through the dungeon. I'm sorry if that's disappointing to anyone, but it honestly seems like the best way to keep the balance of big picture details and small little facts I like to have in this series without having the video be overly long. Black Rock Mountain's plumes of fire, free flowing lava, ash and ground and its red smog filled sky might lead you to think that this volcano has been active forever. But that wasn't always the case. Once it was a mountain range like any other in the region, perhaps even snowy like nearby Kazmadan. But during the Dwarven Civil War known as the War of the Three Hammers, the Thane of the Dark Iron Clan at the time conducted a ritual which he hoped would turn the tides in his favour. What it did instead was summon Ragnaros the Fire Lord into the world, the first time an elemental lord would walk the face of Azeroth in near 20,000 years. And as you can imagine, the near nuclear level blast from summoning basically the living concept of fire was uh, not good for the surrounding area, ecologically speaking. But what Black Rock Mountain lacks in flora and fauna, it makes up for in awe-inspiring size and spectacle. There's something deep-rooted in the human psyche to respect and be wary of volcanoes, Probably a caveman thing, like that weird feeling of unease you get in a bad thunderstorm, and so it makes for the perfect place to turn into a hub of endgame content, Blizzard cleverly calling on only the most experienced and dedicated adventurers to overcome that subconscious feeling of dread and enter the mountain. Just before we do so ourselves, however, I'd like to talk about these gates. This specific gate design is copied on the slightly smaller entrance found in the Searing Gorge, and repeats a few times throughout the dungeon. If you look to the top of the door, you can actually see a tunnel running across it and the front windows along the faces look like hatches that could be opened and fired from, making these gates not only aesthetically intimidating, but a genuine danger too, which works to give a sense of what the Dark Iron Dwarves are all about. The entrance to Black Rock Mountain is reminiscent of Ironforge, very intentionally I'd imagine, with this short hallway beforehand, but while the visual reveal of Ironforge shows us a stout but bustling even cozy city, the reveal this hallway here sets up is this, and I honestly can't talk enough about this. The central pillar draws the eye first, framed by the lava flows. Then your eyes follow the chains back out to the giant statues literally holding up the core of the area, and as you progress up the slope of the ramp, more and more points of interest present themselves to you. Stuff like this is a great example of the differences between games and other media in terms of visual storytelling. A film can show you a cool thing or take you through a cool place, but a game has to make you want to look at them and invite you to experience it in your own way and from your own perspective. The way to Black Rock Depths also cleverly has you pass a number of alternate paths and points of interest, showing again the massive scale of the space, but also hinting that there are many more adventures to be had here. Where our chosen path leads us, however, is to this statue. Conveniently one that we didn't see as we walked in and that a newcomer would have otherwise just assumed was set dressing. Until you get right up here, the game not so subtly indicates that now you have to walk along this narrow chain edge over a boiling pit of magma. You might have noticed that danger has been the operative word thus far in the video, and trust me, it will continue to be so. Before all that though, we have a moment of repose. A few short hallways lead us to this lonely tomb, belonging to the master architect Frank Lorne Fordright, who lived during the War of the Three Hammers and was responsible for the creation of the Stone Wrought Dam in Loch Madan. More impressively, however, he was the chief architect of the Black Rock Spire and Shadow Forge City, meaning everything we've seen and will see has at least a touch of his influence. Coming here as a ghost actually lets you communicate with his spirit, and in his tale he laments the influence of Ragnaros on his people, 
and tasks players with recovering his hammer, Ironfell, which is one of a pair that are considered sacred relics by the Dark Iron. But of course, we don't have all day to chat with long dead ghosts, and so we must continue on. Our continuing descent brings us to this even more perilous chain crossing, and then down into the stone quarry, where we see slaves of many different races, and the ramping up of industrial machines and tools that sets Blackrock depths apart from the other instances within this space. Because while the Blackrock orcs and their dragon masters have seized the upper parts of the mountain as a stronghold, only the dwarves seem to actually be thriving here. Most importantly to us, however, this is where we find the instance portal. The entrance of Blackrock Depth is fairly typical, and actually sort of belies the sprawl and scale of the dungeon for those unfamiliar with it. There's only two paths forward, and one requires a key, so really, there's only one way to go. That changes immediately in the next room, where at least six paths are presented to the player. And while yes, many of them are loops that feed into each other, it's still effective at communicating very early on that this dungeon is something different. All that said though, Blizzard has still cleverly highlighted the preferred first path with the addition of the gallows and cages that the others lack, making it more visually distinct. What we find as we enter this detention block is a mixed garrison of Twilight's Hammer cultists and Anvil Rage dwarves. The Twilight's Hammer of course showing up anywhere even vaguely related to the old gods or elementals. What's interesting though, and something we'll see more of throughout the dungeon, is how integrated they are into the usually wary Dark Iron society. Apparently there's nothing quite like fealty to an elemental lord to really bring people together. We can find a good example of what I mean as we look down from this viewing platform at the end of the hall to our first boss, High Interrogator Gershdan, who seems to have been given basically the entire area to use as a torture chamber for her sadistic and hedonistic tendencies. Beyond that, we don't really know much about her. However, the sheer existence of a viewing platform with big throne-style seats for a torture room also speaks volumes to the culture of the Dark Iron, at least before they had to clean up their act to join the Alliance. So while it's possible, and quicker, to simply turn around and backtrack, the dungeon cleverly offers us a way to avoid doing so by getting on this circular path and maintaining the flow of the dungeon. I was saying before that Blizzard tried as much as possible to nudge players to go to this part of the dungeon first, and I think that's backed up by the fact that this is the only self-contained area within the first half of the dungeon. All the others branch off and can get you lost very, very quickly. The next cavern loop we enter initially seems very plain until this gate appears around the corner. Set at a pretty steep slope so we have to go right up to it to see properly inside, at which point you find yourself in the Ring of Law. A massive arena, scattered with various corpses the Dark Iron use for equal parts criminal justice and entertainment. And as we step into the centre of the arena, High Justice Grimstone appears and we find ourselves becoming the next part of the show, at which point the gates lock and a randomly chosen wave of enemies attacks, followed by a mini boss chosen from a small pool. While the cliche of a circular arena that locks behind you as you enter is basically as old as RPGs are, this is still effective because the Roman-esque capital punishment in the form of public blood sport thing feels right on theme for the Dark Iron Dwarves, provides a slightly different and thus more memorable boss for a place that, you know, has a few of them. Interestingly, the Dungeon Journal states that it's unknown if anyone has ever lived through the Ring of Law trials and, somewhat amusingly once we do, all the gates open up letting us skip a fair chunk of the dungeon. A strange reward for a criminal you just tried to execute. We however will not be doing that, and instead continuing on our previous path, along which at some point we find our next boss, Lord Rockor. And Rockor is honestly one of the most interesting bosses in the dungeon. He appears to be an earth elemental, though obviously of a lava or magma variety, and he's the only one of his kind in the entire place. It seems the elementals of a kind that could fall into two of the primary four, like magma or storm, can choose which elemental lord to hold allegiance to, as they don't fit 100% in either camp, as we can see with the case of Rockor here, who serves Ragnaros but has intentionally gotten himself in trouble with the fire lord, and assigned away from the other high ranked fire elementals to avoid their bickering and jockeying for power. Not far down the path from Rockor, we find this opening in the cavern wall, highlighted by a red glow and that's basically begging players to stop and take a look for a second. And the vista that greets you is a stark reminder of the scale and sheer enormity of this dungeon and Blackrock Mountain in general. This is sort of the having your cake and eating it too of dungeon aesthetics. The closed in tunnel and cave feel is maintained while also reminding players that they are in a small early part of a truly grand adventure. And as we spin around to continue that adventure, 
we spot our next point of interest along the way. These kennels are obviously for use in the arena above us, as we can tell from the elevator platform in the centre, hitting again that Roman Colosseum comparison of a culture so used to displays of brutality that they need to invent tools and mechanisms to keep it interesting to watch. It's also here that we find Houndmaster Grebmar. According to the journal, he genuinely cares for the dogs he raises and considers them family. It's not really reflected in the space or the encounter, but it still makes for a nice bit of humanising for those looking into it. From the kennels, we wind our way around and return again to the main room of this part of the dungeon. And this is where we'll be breaking with the path of the original experience, for the sake of covering all the bosses with dungeon journal entries in a more flowing and escalating manner. What I mean by that is for those unfamiliar with this dungeon, this gate originally required a key gained by defeating a boss further in, and then you'd have to come back this way. Today, however, we'll just be passing through it and on to the Dark Iron Highway. And obviously, with the benefit of modern draw distance and graphics capabilities, we can already see the most interesting part of the highway in its massive molten giant form down the way. But the whole thing is pretty impressive. It's a huge paved path surrounded by dozens of marching and drilling military squads. It's pretty easy to envision as one of the major transport arteries for goods and people in the Shadow Forge city, akin to something like Fifth Avenue in New York or the Champs Elysees in Paris. Now, as to our big eye catching friend, he is Baelgar, who was appointed personally to guard this sealed gate by Ragnaros. No one knows what's behind it, and Blizzard's never mentioned anything about it being cut content or some sort of secret. In fact, the dungeon journal and some quest text actually lampshades that. All we know now is that it's the one example that comes to mind of this type of gate being fully sealed. The other end of the highway contains another such gate that signals the end of the first act of the Blackrock Depths in terms of theme as we move away from seemingly natural tunnels and caverns into Shadow Forge City proper. We're still very much underground, so there's no massive environmental shift, but the change in space is clear enough all the same. Everything we see from here on in the dungeon has been touched by the hand of industry, and built or carved for a purpose. The visual setup done here for the next boss is also super cool. It's another straight shot down a massive hallway like we saw with Baelgar and will do a few more times in the instance, but the combination of the walls narrowing our vision in and each fire elemental standing guard under a lantern that creates a sort of spotlight effect from their combined glow just looks incredible and really adds importance and gravitas to the room. As well it should, because this is the Black Anvil and patrolling it we find Lord Incendius. So first, to Incendius, mostly because he passed too quickly and wouldn't stay out of frame while I was trying to get footage of the anvil. Incendius, we're told, is a student of Baron Geddon, who was once Ragnaros' right-hand man, but it seems the Baron is wary of being upstaged by his protege, so it gave him the important, but not exactly flashy job, of guarding the Dark Iron Dwarf's sacred black anvil. The anvil itself works as yet another mirror to Ironforge, specifically the Great Anvil in the heart of that city. But while the Great Anvil sits in the middle of a bustling forge district surrounded by stores and people, the Black Anvil sits alone, dangerously close to a pool of magma. It can be viewed from the houses and workplaces on the platforms above, but not gotten close to easily. Which speaks to the emphasis on grandeur and the deep class divides in Dark Iron society. And it's at the start of the very next room we find our very next boss, Phineas Darkfire, the current chief architect of the Dark Iron, Though it's a title we're told he doesn't quite deserve, having gained his fame passing off the work of others as his own. He's also the current wielder of the hammer Ironfell, which was originally needed as part of the quest chain to earn the Shadow Forge key. He also interestingly uses paladin type abilities in his encounter, but that goes unremarked on in any quests or lore about him, so it's more likely an arbitrary choice by encounter designers than any attempt to justify playable Dark Iron Paladin some 13 years down the line. There's a lot said in the lore about the Dark Iron's proficiency in creating war golems, and as we can see, this hall of crafting is the first step in that process, as the golems are carved from rock. It's also a really cool little bit of environmental design, that the golem carvings do in fact get more and more finished as you progress up these ramps, giving a true assembly line feel. And from the hall, we emerge into the residential and presumably commercial part of the city, given its central location at least. It's also here that we see just how interwoven the Twilight's Hammer and Dark Iron have become, not only with these chatty packs of enemies, but also in the amount of these crystals scattered around the place. 
And in my opinion, these are interesting in and of themselves. They crop up wherever Old God, or especially Cthulhu's influence is, so they're commonly assumed to be his crystallized blood or something of the sort, but given recent lore, I think they deserve another look. Simply compare how similar their colouring is to that of Azerite. And as tempting as it is to turn this into a lore conspiracy video at this point, we have a dungeon to continue through. And in fact, right next to us, we have the Black Vault, functionally the bank of Shadowforge City, which we find guarded by Warden Stilgis and Varric. The journal tells us that Stilgis is in fact one of Emperor Thorasan's most trusted allies, which explains how he got this high profile position. He also seems to be a frost mage, which would be a very hard discipline to master in an environment like Blackrock Mountain, which also speaks to his ability. The Black Vault itself is fun in the sense that, yes, it obviously adds to the fantasy of this being a functioning city, but these vaults can actually be opened and looted with keys from around the dungeon, letting players really indulge their murder hobo tendencies. The four golems in the center can actually activate as well when all the coffers have been opened, which is a nice touch, but you'd think the security system would start working before everything got stolen. Eh. From the city center, we continue on and into the domicile which seems to be equal parts barracks, storeroom and housing, which is super fitting for a society as highly militarized as the Dark Iron. Prominently we also see a large amount and variety of drinks around the room, fitting that classic hard drinking, hard working and hard fighting dwarven stereotype, and also hinting at the Grim Guzzler, which we'll see in the follow up video. And then from the domicile, we're led onto this bridge, which focuses the flow of space back in again, to these long straight line halls the blizzard seems to use to highlight places of significance or reverence in this dungeon compared to the more open parts which tend to be more mundane in purpose. It's here in the shrine of Thorasan that we begin to meet some of the alternate paths from earlier which should hopefully give you an idea of just how branching this dungeon can be and it's also where we find the greatest concentration of twilight influence in the dungeon with these huge portals and the next and final boss for part one Pyromancer Lorgrain. Lorgrain was once a high ranking shaman of the Earthen Ring who defected to the Twilight's Hammer for unknown reasons, though it seems a fairly popular thing for shaman to do, so we can assume it has maybe something to do with their connection to the Earth, making them vulnerable to the whispers of the old gods, like what happened with Deathwing. Regardless, the Dungeon Journal tells us that since then he has become fascinated with the work of Frank Lorne Forgerite, which explains why we find him here at Forgerite's monument meditating and giving commands to his followers. With Lorgrain's death, we do not close the story of Blackrock Depths. Not nearly. This place still has much to offer in terms of adventure and danger, which, judging by the length of this script, will be a story for another time. I've been Shubsy, and that was some of the story of the space and how the space has told some of the story. I hope you enjoyed the video. I didn't expect it to take this long to come out, and I'm sorry, but a combination of real world events and me underestimating the dungeon led to far more of a delay than I intended. Don't ask me how I underestimated the biggest dungeon ever made, but I did. As I said at the start though, this does mean now that things like L and UBRS are far more approachable with most of the setup for Blackrock Mountain as a whole done already. I'm probably going to do the Stormwind Stockades next, mostly just as an experiment to see how much I can optimize the production side of things when the script isn't too challenging, so look for that genuinely I promise in the coming weeks. And always if you enjoy the video hitting the like button and or leaving a comment lets me know and I love engaging with you guys in discussion and subscribing lets me know that you want more. So thank you for your time.